So it's a, an absolute um, privilege to join um, this conference and looking through the list of delegates, uh, you out there, I, um, I see a number of people that I, I know well that I've trained alongside or I've trained. Um, lovely to see you all again. And for those of you who I don't know, nice to meet you and welcome to this presentation. Um, I'm going to be spending the next 50 minutes or so talking to you about a topic that's very close to my heart, um, uh, which is something I've devoted my career to, which is um, thinking about how we can prevent depression, but latterly go, going beyond that to think about whole population approaches. Um, just a few words before I start the presentation properly. It's I'm going to um, I'm, I'm mindful that the audience is quite a broad audience, uh, which is great. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, paint a picture with quite a, um, a broad brush. What I mean by that is um, I'll be covering quite a lot of ground um, and sometimes I'll be describing large complex studies. In some cases, they took five, seven years to do in just a minute or so. Um, but on each of the slides, what I've done is provided a DOI and a link to the paper. And most of the papers and the science that I'll be citing is um, open access. So um, I'm going to make my slides available afterwards and you'll be able to access all of those resources if you want to dig a bit more deeply into any of the work that I'll be describing. As a scientist, it, it sometimes um, is a little galling um, to take seven years of work and describe it in 30 seconds. So I ask you to show confidence that when I describe something in that way, um, I've thought very carefully about how to distill it into um, something very brief. So what I'm gonna do is um, try and share my screen. Hopefully that will work. Um, so what I'd like to do is um, cover four broad areas. I want to talk a little bit about where um, our work at the Oxford Mindfulness Center and my work started, which is with depression and the public health challenge that it presents and how we as a worldwide community can respond to that challenge. Then I want to outline um, the work on mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, which is probably now about 20, 25 years worth of work and tell you the story so far. But more importantly, um, I want to finish with outlining some of the ways in which um, this work is developing. I think it would be um, appropriate and helpful if we um, maybe just start with, um, with some practice. Um, so just a couple of minutes of practice and um, just having um, a moment to um, begin with registering the state of your mind and body just now. So what's the kind of climate of your mind? What thoughts, images, mental states are around just now? Maybe the mind is very busy and or maybe it's very calm and steady. Maybe the sense of curiosity or perhaps even skepticism sense of energy, or maybe given it's the end of the day, a sense of fatigue, simply noting the state of the mind just now. And then doing the same with the climate of the body. So just scanning through the body from the soles of the feet all the way up through the body and just noting anything that's around in the body, any areas of ease or peace or contentment. There might be some discomfort or some pain. It's absolutely fine to make any adjustments you want to make as you note the state of the body just now. So this is the first step of the three-step breathing space. Just noting the state of the mind, noting the state of the body. And what we're gonna do now in the second step is very deliberately, very intentionally take your attention and bring it to an anchor somewhere in the body. For many people, this is the breath, but it could be the soles of the feet, it could be the hands, anywhere in the body where you can steady and stabilize your attention just now. So bringing your awareness and letting it settle into the anchor somewhere in your body. Nowhere to be, nothing to fix, simply 
anchoring, steadying, stabilizing your attention in this moment. Just letting the mind states, the body states that you just noted be on the edge of awareness and choosing to bring into the foreground of awareness this anchor in the body. When the mind wanders to hearing, thinking, that's the point of an anchor, right? That actually the boat will be pulled away and tug on the rope and you just notice that happening and you come back to the anchor. It's all just part of the process. And then just in the third step of this breathing space, the final step, just broadening your awareness out to a sense of the whole body sitting or standing here the anchor available to you, thoughts and feelings coming and going, body sensations coming and going, perhaps with a sense of interest, a sense of kindness, a sense of care. So transitioning from the practice back into the presentation. <coughs> and just as we go through the presentation, I might invite you once or twice just to come back to that anchor and come back to the body. The whole thrust of the work, if you like, of mindfulness-based programs is giving people this sense that there is also always this possibility to come back to the mind, come back to the body, anchor, and in that moment, begin to have choices. Choices about how we respond, how we think, what we say, what we do. And that's sometimes described as something that can be really um, liberating, really empowering. And in the case of depression, which is what I'm gonna talk about first of all, can actually help people with a history of depression begin to recognize and step back from patterns of depression. So what is this public health problem of depression? It's extraordinary to see um, so many countries represented on this call here today. Across the world, the World Health Organization estimates that if you were to assess everybody in the world today, some 250 to 300 million people would right now meet diagnostic criteria for major depression. If you look at the world population, some 1 billion people will suffer from depression at some point in their lifetime. As we make inroads with other major diseases like heart disease, waterborne diseases, um, um, viruses, um, depression becomes higher and higher in the World Health Organization rankings in terms of quality adjusted life years lost. I'll say a bit more about why that is in a moment. And of course, it creates untold human suffering. We've just been struck by a major pandemic of COVID-19. But before COVID-19, we already had a pandemic, a pandemic of mental health problems. And the most common ones are depression and anxiety. Those are all big numbers and big picture. Let's make this a bit more human. This is somebody who I'll come back to a few times during the course of my presentation. He's somebody who was in one of my mindfulness classes, I'm gonna say about 20 years ago, 15 years ago. It's called Di Kerman. He was in some ways an extraordinary man, in some ways a very ordinary man. He was a secondary school teacher. He was um, an English teacher. He was a father to two teenage children. He was a husband and he was somebody who liked to play and to listen to music. In some ways, a very average man. He started to suffer from depression in his late teens and had a series of depressive episodes throughout his life, quite disabling to the point of needing to take time away and off work. And I'll come back to Di and tell you why I'm telling you about him um, a little bit more as we go along. 
I notice that various people are, are raising their hands. I'm going to just keep questions um, to the last um, to the last part of the talk. So they will be um, they will be accrued and they will be noted. And whoever's moderating the session um, will come to those at the end. So if that's the problem, how can we respond? <clears throat> so there's a couple of things I want to say about that. The first is, I think there's a, a, a real growing acknowledgement that um, depression is something that has a number of different levels. It's sometimes described as biopsychosocial. So it has biological elements. There are certainly genetic and biochemical elements. It has psychological elements, the way we think and we behave. It has social elements inequality, gender inequality, and there are larger systemic issues that um, drive on depression. Any response will need to address all of these issues. Another really important point to make is I think that we have really got to rethink how we consider mental health and physical health as really an integrated whole. I think in some ways, the way healthcare systems and the history of medicine has evolved has not served us particularly well because we have separated out the mental and the physical. And the reality is that with a disorder like depression and with mental health more broadly, it is really a systemic um, mind body um, problem and the response will also be a systemic mind body problem. Consider for example, sleep, consider for example, diet, consider for site example, exercise. These are three very, in a way, simple ways of addressing and improving mental health. And of course, they are, both, they are all profoundly physical and psychological, and in some cases, social too. They affect the endocrine system, they affect the neuro, um, the, 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 our neurobiology, they affect, they affect the way our sympathetic and our parasympathetic nervous system works, they, they affect the way we learn and make sense of the world. We need to really think about people in a much more integrated way to respond to depression. So those are some of the top level things I wanted to say about how we might respond. So let's talk now about MBCT. Look, the reality is, if this is um, the burden of depression in this iceberg, how are we currently responding? Well, I think we're probably only responding to the tip of the iceberg. If there are 7 billion people in the world and 1 billion of those will get depressed at some point in their life, um, probably the reality is that we are barely responding to those billion people. And those that we are responding to, um, uh, we are probably offering them antidepressant medication or some very low intensity primary care type interventions. But the idea of offering anything more thoughtful and integrated and staged, I think we're a long way away from that at an international global level. Of course, a third of the population live in India and China. And those are our healthcare systems that are very much in evolution at the moment. So there is a great opportunity there to begin to think about how we might respond to the problem of depression. Jeffrey Rose was a really interesting thinker. Um, and this is a, a graph which I, has really made a big impact on the way I think. So this is um, the population, if you like, and um, the population represented as a normal distribution. So the majority of the population are in the middle and there's a, a set at the tail end at the top who are doing really well and a, a set at the tail end on the left who are really struggling with their mental health at any given time. And what Jeffrey Rose, um, he started off with arguments around, for example, heart disease. So if you really want to address heart disease in the world, there's no point just dealing with the people who are at very high risk of a heart attack right now or have just had a heart attack. Yes, one needs to do that. Of course one does. But if you really want to improve heart health, you need to work with the whole population. And I'd like to argue that the same is true with depression. Yes, we can deal with it, um, the people who are currently depressed and offer them treatment, move them from depression to doing, doing okay. But if we really want to deal with that iceberg of depression, we need to think about the whole population and improving the whole population in the way we have in the last 50 years done with heart health. What does that look like? <coughs> well, the way Jeffrey Rose argues, argues it, and the, the way I'd like to present it in relation to depression, 
is that you can work with people from higher risk to lower risk for depression with psychological approaches. So if you go for the highest risk group of people, these are people maybe who've already had a few episodes of depression. And by virtue of that, they are at very high risk of getting depressed again. And this actually is where MBCT for recurrent depression came in. I'll come back to that in a moment. But you can also work with people at lower risk. Now, I'll give you an example of that. We know that maternal and to a degree paternal depression are risk factors for depression. So a parenting program that works with mothers and fathers in the perinatal period, or ideally even during pregnancy, and talks about parenting and positive parenting and parenting that will promote in the, the mental health of, of their offspring is the example of a selective um, prevention approach that could do something to improve um, depression outcomes in their children. Universal is something that would be done for the population as a whole, including those who are at quite low risk. So to use the heart disease example, this would be to um, improve people's diets, the whole population's diets. In relation to depression, one of the things that we know drives depression is um, social inequality um, and gender inequality. So if one were to address um, deprivation and gender inequality, given that, that, that depression is two to three times more likely in girls and women than it is in, in men, these are likely to be things that would reduce the burden of depression um, in the population. And then the final thing I want to say about depression before I really start digging into um, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy is it's important to be thoughtful about the typical life course of depression. So um, this is this is birth, this is through to um, life, the uh, late life, and this is mental health. So high mental health up here and full depression down here, depressive episode, low grade depression here. Typically, and um, Di Cohen, the, the case I presented earlier was an example of this. Typically people um, who suffer from recurrent depression will have had a first onset in late adolescence and early adulthood. They may well not fully recover from that. They'll have some residual symptoms. Self-esteem will have been knocked. Um, attention and concentration may not fully come back. Um, sleep may be disturbed. And these low-grade depressive symptoms are a real marker for further risk of depression. Some 17 to 90% of people will then go on to have a recurrent and relapsing course of depression. Um, and that's why the World Health Organization says that this is such a major public health problem, because it essentially becomes a recurrent, relapsing and chronic condition. So what MBCT for depression does says, well, let's take people at really high risk. I already said these are people who have got a 90% chance of dipping into another episode of depression. And let's offer them an intervention that can prevent that course of depression unfolding at really high risk. And here's an intervention developed to work with that. <clears throat> Many of you will be familiar with this approach, but for those of you who aren't, this is an approach developed by Zindel Siegel, Mark Williams, and John Teasdale in the late 1990s. And it's a group-based um, psychoeducational approach, if you like. So a MBCT teacher or therapist will take a group of 12 to 15 people through an eight-week weekly program of learning mindfulness skills and cognitive behavioral skills that help them in essence to spot the early warning signs of depressive relapse both in how they behave and in their mental patterns and in what's happening for them and learn ways to respond differently at those crucial crucial points and it's a fairly intensive program. It involves quite a big commitment from folks and the training is quite intense. I'll say a bit more about that later. But let me tell you now about what we've learned in the last 20, 25 years about MBCT for depression. In 2015, not that long ago, just six years ago, um, Zindel Siegel and Senator Dimidian published the paper and they said, look, a lot of the work on MBCT is quite early. It's sort of proof of concept stuff, preliminary, not a lot of stuff on whether you have decent randomized control trials, our skin is ineffective, and almost nothing on whether it's scalable and implementable. And I'd like to suggest that actually that has really changed. And don't just take my word for it. Let me tell you why I think that's changed. So this is where I start describing you know, huge amounts of work in relatively brief slides. So this is a, um, a, a, 
an individual patient data meta-analysis. For those of you who are not familiar, this is basically where you take um, a number of randomized controlled trials and you combine the data, the actual original data from those into one data set. And you ask a question using the power of all of those studies. So this is something that we did with all of the randomized controlled trials asking, is MBCT for depression effective? At that point, there were about um, 10 RCTs. We got nine of them, about 1,200 people. And these are the RCTs, top down, these are the RCTs. Those of you who um, know about meta-analysis, you can look at this graph. Those of you who don't, basically the way it works is that this is the, um, the bottom here. This is the amalgamation of all the RCTs. Towards the left means it works, towards the right means it's harmful. And if um, the line is crossing the middle here, the zero, it means that um, you're uncertain. It's, it's not clear one way or the other. And what you can see very clearly from this diamond here is that when you take all this data together from randomized control lab trials asking, does MBCT help people with a history of depression stay well? The answer is yes, with no margin of error. The comparison groups are quite varied, but it's a very definitive answer to that question. This is an effective way of helping people prevent depression. Now, I've already said that the main way we're currently helping people is with antidepressant medication. But a lot of people on medication um, would like an alternative approach. They'd like to learn skills to stay well in the long term. Why is that? Well, first of all, meds only work for as long as you take them. They don't have an effect beyond that, whereas life skills work as long as you use them. And some of the meds have side effects. You know, for example, the SSRIs can knock out people's um, uh, libido and enjoyment and sexuality in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a partnership, in a loving relationship. That can be a real issue for people. So a lot of people would like to have an alternative to antidepressant medication. So we asked in this study whether or not MBCT could provide an alternative to antidepressants. So 420 people very bravely came into this trial and half were randomized to stay on their antidepressants and the other half were asked to come off their antidepressants and use MBCT as a way to stay well. This is the beginning of the trial. This is the end of the trial, two year follow-up. And this is, um, as you go down, you see more and more people relapsing, which is what happens with depression. Um, and what you can see is that the lines look very comparable. This is the antidepressant group where you see about 48% hadn't relapsed. And in the MBC2 group, 52% had not relapsed. There was no difference between those two groups. So we went back to the, um, the IPD and um, the individual patient data meta-analysis. And we um, asked whether or not... Um, MBCT could provide an alternative to antidepressants. And this has actually just been updated in this paper in JAMA Psychiatry that came out just very recently, which also includes actually a CBT trial. So this is a CBT trial. These three are MBCT trials. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a bit of a summer cold. And what you can see is that MBCT and cognitive behavioral therapy are offering people, the hundreds of millions of people around the world, on maintenance antidepressants, a potential alternative. And in our study, we also asked about cost effectiveness. And MBCT is um, costing about 112 US dollars per person, which is comparable um, to maintenance antidepressants and probably better than um, individual psychotherapies. So what we have in MBCT is something that is pretty clearly helpful um, and is probably as helpful as um, something we already know works, which is staying on anti antidepressants long term. There's been quite a lot of talk about, well, maybe mindfulness could be harmful. You know, if it's potent, does it, does it prove to be harmful? And a lot of, um, I love the quote from Paul Meal in the absence of data, opinion prevails. So there's a lot of opinion expressed about this. So we thought, well, let's get some data. So Ruth Bayer led a piece of work and we looked at the data on rates of harm in um, MBCT and MBSR. And Ruth did a wonderful piece of work in this paper. Again, you can find this paper online, demonstrating that in well-conducted trials, 
rates of harm were no higher than in any other psychological approach. Uh, and maybe some of that, um, the overstatement about the harms relates to things like retreats where people with um, very little um, training were, and, and quite hard, vulnerable people were going into long retreats, um, mindfulness retreats, I mean, and experiencing some unpleasant um, and, and potentially adverse and harmful experiences. But within MBSR and MBCT, we found no evidence of harm, but clearly more research and thought needs to go into this area. So um, all of this has very little value if we don't actually make an approach that we now know is helpful at preventing depression more widely available. And so we've started to do some work in this area and try to understand the kind of barriers and facilitators to mindfulness-based cognitive therapy being more widely available for people who actually suffer from depression. And I'm not gonna go into the details of this, but it's not easy to integrate preventative approaches into healthcare systems. That being said, MBCT is now in the clinical guidelines that I'm aware of, of at least 12 different countries. And certainly within um, the UK and in some other countries, it is becoming more increasingly accessible in those countries. Why would it not be? It's cost effective, it's, it's, um, it's effective, it's uh, acceptable, um, it's not for everybody, but it's acceptable. And it's something that actually can save um, healthcare systems and countries in the long term. We also went on to ask in this study, and again, I'll just say this very briefly, but it's important. One of the critiques is sometimes that, well, you've just demonstrated all these nice findings in randomized controlled trials. What about in the real world? So this is a real world study. So we looked at... Um, the UK healthcare system, and we looked at four large mental health services that were routinely collecting outcome data for people going through MBCT classes with depression. And we have found that the effects on depression um, and prevention with uh, a proxy measure of uh, depressive relapse were comparable to the randomized controlled trials. You can see here rates of recovery, reliable recovery and sustained recovery were really very encouraging indeed. So again, the conclusion I take away from that is that this is potentially implementable and when it is, we can replicate the findings in the real world. MBCT and mindfulness-based approaches more broadly have sometimes operated um, out, out with kind of the constraints of um, and the advantages of healthcare systems, education systems, and so on. And so at the Oxford Mindfulness Centre, we have done quite a lot of thinking about um, sort of providing the community with, well, first of all, ourselves, actually, and then the community with something of an ethical compass to navigate all of this. And so we, we've, we've published that, and that's available on our website. But we have also gone on um, together with many colleagues around the world, including um, uh, our collaborators in, um, in Singapore, in China, in, 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 in uh, Hong Kong, in Taiwan, um, in Japan, um, and in Malaysia, to think about how to um, train MBCT teachers. All of this requires well-trained and qualified um, MBCT trainers. This was, um, this was us working in, um, I think this was in Shanghai a couple of years ago. Um, this was, I believe, in Taiwan. Um, so we um, have done a lot of training and a lot of training centers, including in Singapore and many of the countries represented here are now training the next generation of MBCT therapists. And Zindel Siegel set up this resource here, which is to enable members of the public to identify well-trained MBCT therapists. I think it's a really important hub that I'd like to point to. It's called Access MBCT. And then finally, there is also the work to be done on influencing policymakers and making sure that all of this work we've done is represented at governmental levels and in policy and in not just healthcare, but I, I will talk to some of the other areas that we're developing um, as well. So just to summarize, the story with MBCT for depression so far is that it's certainly not a panacea, 
but it does clearly offer those with a substantial history of depression a new approach to learning skills to stay well in the long term. I think it's an exemplar of um, that kind of arc of research to implementation over the last 20, 25 years. Where are we going now? What are some of the new developments? Well, one of the new developments is thinking about young people, particularly young people at high risk. So these are folks with um, uh, low grade depressive symptoms, maybe are already within mental health services. And together with my colleague Tamsin Ford, what we've done is developed mindfulness-based cognitive therapy uh, um, and um, developed uh, a, a parallel program for um, parents. So the, the young people, the teenagers and the parents both go through eight week MBCT programs as a way of preventing depression. The early data is very encouraging, but we want on, to go on to do larger scale work. So remember the work I just told you about, the adult work, that was a trajectory, an arc of 20 years. This, to do this work well takes time. And this is something that Richard Davidson in an editorial um, um, wrote about as well. If we really want to improve this area of work, we need to think carefully about the theory that drives it. We need to think carefully about how we measure the constructs. And we need to think carefully about um, how we scale and implement things. So let me just check the time. I think I'm okay. Maybe just taking a pause and just coming back and checking into the body the anchor in the body, just seeing if the mind is feeling settled and attentive and engaged. And if it is, just giving yourself permission just to come into the body, allowing yourself just to be, just to settle. If the mind feels like it's got distracted and caught up in phone messages or email or anything going on in the background. It's okay, just noticing that too, and just seeing if you want to make a choice to gather and steady the attention, coming back to the anchor. So it's something that's available to us in every moment of our life, including this moment. This ability to just note the state of our mind just now, the state of our body just now, regather the attention, anchor it. And then the beauty of this work within MBCT is in this moment, asking yourself this question, what the support my attention, my ability to engage with this lecture just now. Do I need to do a bit of a stretch, have a drink of water, do a bit of quick qigong, rub my face. What will support my attention just now? Turn off my email. Great, thank you. So one of the things that I think is really beautiful about um, MBCT for recurrent depression, which is I should think also really beautiful about cognitive behavioral therapy. I had the great privilege of working with um, Aaron T. Beck for two years uh, as a postdoc in the um, late 1990s, <coughs> is that what um, John, um, Teasdale and Mark Williams and Little Siegel did so beautifully was to really articulate what is it that's driving recurrent depression and how is MBCT for depression helping with that? And I think that kind of map and that roadmap is what makes MBCT so powerful and what makes us as MBCT teachers potentially so potent. If we know what's driving depression for the, the 12 people sitting around our class and we know how the program that we're teaching can help unlock that for people. That, that makes us potentially such potent teachers or in our own practice or in our own lives too. 
So this is um, a lovely, lovely illustrated book by Matthew Johnston called I Had a Black Dog. It's on the WHO website. They put it up there as an illustrated book with Matthew's permission. It's, it's, it's had many millions of views because it's just such a beautiful illustration of what depression, or what the experience of depression is like and what the, the, the journey of recovery looks like as well. So this is Matthew, um, he's woken up early morning waking on the symptoms of depression at 3.20 in the morning, as you can see. And on the wall behind him, you can see what's running through his mind. Life is hard, I'm no good, I feel bad, I'm gonna be tired tomorrow. I can't remember what it's like to feel good. And he uses, um, he uses the metaphor that Winston Churchill also used of um, a black dog. So when he suffers from depression, it's like he's being visited by a black dog. So as you can see, the black dog is here sitting on him. And this is just a very, I think, powerful illustration of the experience of depression. And the argument with recurrent depression is that these moments, so early morning waking, this flood of ruminative negative thinking, this is the early stage of depression. And whether somebody gets drawn into this vortex is um, the process of relapse. And what MBCT is trying to do is to, <coughs> let me just pause and go back. And there's lots of evidence that this is the case, that this, this tendency um, to get sucked into this ruminative, proliferative style of thinking is what can drive um, depressive relapse. And what MBCT for depression is trying to help people to do is to, is to recognize that happening, when people see that happening, to see that, to be able to step back from it, something called decentering, if you like, see it from a different perspective, not get drawn into it, and then ask the same question I asked you just now, what would be a skillful response just now? What would be a way of looking after myself that doesn't involve getting sucked into this vortex? And what you see in the second slide here is Matthew engaging a whole range of skills, journaling, um, the simplicity of you know, drinking a nice cup of tea, mindfulness practice. Now, the black dog has not gone away. You can see that the black dog is still there. So he can still be visited by the black dog, but his relationship to this negative thinking and this patterns of depressive relapse has changed. And that is what we now know from the research is happening for people when they go through an MBCT program. They can recognize these negative thoughts. They will realize that their thoughts are not facts. They can learn to decenter, come into their body and learn to respond in ways that are about self-care, are about behavioral activation, are about the sorts of things that are an antidote to depression exercise, um, um, and so on. This is a study um, that's uh, just been completed by one of my um, PhD students. In fact, she just got her PhD yesterday, and my van der Velden, in which we asked people with a history of depression going through an MBCT program to go through an fMRI scanner before and after the MBCT. And we asked them to um, engage in one of these kind of exercises where they get start doing negative and thinking. And what we were able to demonstrate was at a psychological sen uh, sense, people who've gone through MBCT learn to decenter, learn to come into their bodies, and that this is um, um, unique to depression and not to the control condition in this study, which was weightless control. And that this was mirrored in changes in the salience network. So the salience network is a uh, a, a very central um, brain network that's involved in the way in which um, attention is deployed, um, uh, emotion regulation works, and attention can be moved from the room into the pattern, patterning into the body and into um, um, interrupting these kind of ruminative cycles. So there is good evidence emerging that MBCT works through the mechanisms that it's supposed to work. And I want to just finish this section with something which I think is really important and really promising and is actually driving our work going forwards. There is evidence. So a number of depressed people who have been through, people who suffer from depression have been through my classes have said to me, and through cognitive behavioral therapy have said to me, that recovery from depression <coughs> is not just about learning to deal with the dark. It's not just about moving from depression to languishing. 
for me, if I'm really going to recover, I need to be able to learn to move into the light, which is an expression that was used with Amelia. I need to be able to um, learn to live with greater happiness, with greater joy, with a greater sense of appreciation. And antidepressants don't necessarily help with that. And in fact, the way MBCT sometimes is taught can not help with that. And certainly many psychological therapies are much more about, okay, let's deal with the depression and get people to from minus wherever to zero. But what about moving people from zero to the plus numbers? And there is really good evidence now from the work of my friend and colleague, Barney Dunn with cognitive behavioral therapy, that augmenting, early promising evidence, I should say, that augmenting cognitive behavioral therapy with supporting people to move towards positive aspects of their lives, engaging with their values, engaging with things that give them a sense of meaning, a sense of purpose, a sense of joy, improves outcomes. And there is also evidence from MBCT now, two studies, I believe, one that's on here and another more recent one, showing that um, MBCT, for example, the positive experience calendar that's used in MBCT, can begin to awaken the positive valence system, that people uh, move away not just from the negative thoughts, but they begin to actually um, tune in to the things that are right in their life, the things that give them a sense of pleasure, a sense of meaning, a sense of, sense of joy. And this may well be a key mechanism of change. If we can do that, we can improve our outcomes for MBCT, for depression. So let me just um, come back to Di Cohen. Di Cohen went through my MBCT program and afterwards he kept in touch with me and he told me how he was using the MBCT and the things he'd learned in other areas of his life. So he developed um, quite an unpleasant um, condition, uh, bone cancer. So there's a lot of pain and a lot of treatment. And he said, all of the skills I learned, I'm now using in relation to the pain and all of the uncertainty and so on around um, the, the bone cancer. In fact, he once wrote to me from a ward following a bone marrow transplant, which is a really unpleasant and difficult process and how this was um, something that he was working with and was helpful to him. And then actually later in his life, when he knew that he was now likely to die and he was in palliative care, he wrote to me really movingly about how he was now at a phase of exercising compassion in relation to his children who were teenagers and his wife. How could he make his passing and his death mm. less difficult for them? And I thought that was just an extraordinary act of, to use sort of somewhat mechanistic language of decentering, stepping back from his own experience and trying to ease the journey for his um, of his passing for his family members. And this is a story that we hear over and over again, that the skills that are learned in MBCT are not just about the prevention of depression. They are about many foundational skills that can help people throughout their lives. And this is what led Christina Feldman and I to write this book. This is a book that tries to take the very best of modern psychology and ancient contemplative traditions, particularly Buddhist psychology, traditions that are thousands of years old that are in the service of trying to understand the human mind and um, mental trainings to support the cultivation of the human mind and provide for people going through eight-week programs, but primarily actually for people teaching eight-week mindfulness-based programs, a sort of map that they can use to support people like Dai and the many thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of others, these skills for life. And in a nutshell, I love this quote, between stimulus and reaction, there is a space. And in that space, we can choose our responses and what people are learning in mindfulness. I've got pain in Dai's case. How do I choose to respond? There's a bit of a space there. That choice provides a sense of freedom, a chance to realize our human potential and to flourish. And the universal mechanisms that we spell out in our book are, I think, threefold. It's complicated, there are many, but we've tried to summarize them as three. First, learning that our attention is something that actually very often we give away. We allow others to hijack and take our attention. So the first skill that we're learning is that actually we have a choice about that and we can reclaim our attention. We can use mindfulness practices to learn how we use and deploy our attention. Having done that, so many doorways open up to us. 
And this ability to then stand back from our experience, internal and external in the world, with a sense of new ways of knowing, bodily based, experiential based, the wisdom of the body, if you like, engaging with the positive aspects of our experience in our lives and also the negative aspects of our experience in our lives. This is the second foundational core skill. And then the third is from that place, beginning to realize that we have choices about how we respond to our bodies, to our thoughts, to the people around us, to the um, issues that arise in our job, to wider societal issues of climate and um, inequality and um, nationalism and so on, wider issues. And we begin to learn that we have choices about how we respond. And finally, this is something that we can do, not just because we have got chronic pain or because we have got a history of depression, but throughout the lifespan. And in fact, Di said to me, I wish I'd known what I know now as a man in his 50s as he was then, as a teenager. And that's what we spent the last seven years doing. We've been doing a program of work asking, can we teach mindfulness to school children in the period 11 through 16 as a way of them learning these foundational skills for life. I can't tell you the results today. I know them. They've been, um, the first big paper has been submitted um, and is currently under review. But um, the, the background to this was that um, we thought there were very good reasons that if we could teach these foundational skills to children, um, this may actually improve their mental health and prevent depression. This was a, 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 another one of these meta-analyses, quite large scale, 3,666 children, all and randomized controlled trials, 33 of them, suggesting promising evidence that mindfulness taught to children could indeed improve their mental health and outcomes. So what we just um, finished doing is a randomized controlled trial with um, 8,000 um, children, 85 schools, followed up over one year. Half of them received mindfulness training, the other half have received um, good social emotional education, but not mindfulness training. And we'll be reporting the um, effects on well-being, mental health, and the prevention of depression in the coming months. But I'd like to just finish by um, to moving this argument a bit further along and saying a lot of what we've done so far has been about risk reduction. Can we take people at very high risk and move towards um, taking them into this end of the spectrum? But what about more population-based approaches? What about using mindfulness with a wider population? And I'm just going to um, skip along here so that we have time for questions. This was, um, just came out yesterday, actually. This is um, the Times Educational Supplement. They've just done a special issue on well-being in schools. Schools have had a really difficult time this last 18 months around the world and coping with the pandemic, with lockdown and the teachers having to hold so much and the children having to hold so much. I think it's really visionary if this prestigious um, publication, which goes out in this country anyway, to the UK, to all school teachers. And they're basically um, published a number of articles, including the one um, in which I talk about the, the need to look at um, well-being of the school, of the head teachers and the senior leadership team, the teachers and the children as being something much more than a zero sum game. It's not just about academic results, but if we don't take care of the well-being of the schools, the teachers and the pupils, they're, they're not going to be in a place to learn. They're not going to be in a place to, to flourish. This needs to be an integrated approach um, across um, across schools that has mindfulness and actually other social emotional um, parts to it. And I think there's huge promise in this area. This is again from the New Scientist, um, a really thoughtful piece um, in which um, the um, in which the um, Joe Marchant, who um, is a very good science journalist, con concludes the consensus from the researchers that the effects of mindfulness meditation, are, are, although often useful, aren't necessarily greater than those of other proven treatments. But um, we also know that while some people get considerable benefits, there's a lot of variation in, paper, in, in how people respond for reasons that we don't yet fully um, understand. What she essentially concludes is that there are, there are pockets where we know that MBCT and MBSR 
really the evidence is very good with depression, chronic pain, and there are a lot of other areas where it's very promising. So I want to just finish up with um, just casting our minds a little bit forward, because I know a lot of this innovative work is happening in um, all around the world, including many of the countries that are represented on this call today. <coughs> this is um, a photograph of my grandparents. This is my grandfather, <clears throat> and this is my grandmother. Um, and I think they were on holiday um, somewhere in the Swiss Alps. My grandfather um, died, I believe, um, in his 50s. And he died of a heart attack, kind of unexpectedly. Nobody really knew that he had a heart condition. And my, um, my grandfather um, was of a generation where everyone smoked. Um, and nobody really paid too much attention to diet. So red meat was pretty typical, typical in, um, uh, part of diet. And um, I don't believe, other than cycling, he ever really exercised. And there was certainly no screening for hypertension or risk for heart disease at that time. If he'd been born when I was born, all of those things are different, right? So smoking is much less common, diet has changed, exercise is much more mainstream, screening for hypertension is pretty routine. So here's a thought experiment for you. That's the change in about 50 years. What change do we need to envisage in the next 50 years for some of the things I've described to become as everyday and as normal around mental health and well-being? The way we parent, for example, the kind of pressures we do and don't put on children, the way we organize our work environments so people feel supported and taken care of so that they can do their work the way we're able to talk openly about mental health and well-being, the way, in the same way that diet and exercise and sleep are thought about widely, what about in relation to mental health, what we eat, whether we exercise, the really central role of sleep hygiene? That's the thought experiment. And I think we're beginning to see the ways in which mindfulness can make a contribution here. So, so I went over that a little bit quickly. Because, because, because it's teaching these core foundational skills for life, focus, attention, self-regulation, responding in a way that's aligned with our values and is likely to promote our well-being, the well-being of those around us. And I love this quote from Vikram Patel in this sort of Lancet um, commission piece, mental health is a fundamental human right. Is this pie in the sky? No, it's not pie in the sky. This is a systematic review of 419 randomized controlled trials, 53,000 people asking, can psychological approaches improve mental health and well-being. These are the different types of approaches they looked at. This is mindfulness approaches. This is approaches that um, PPI stands here for positive psychology interventions, either singular ones like appreciation practices or combined ones. <coughs> what you can see is that in the general population, towards the right here is um, um, uh, you know, a positive effect of these interventions. Mindfulness interventions are able to move the general population towards greater health, mental health and well-being. Which ones? Well, I'm going to talk about one that I know well, which my friend and predecessor of the Oxford Mindfulness Centre, Mark Williams, together with Danny Penman, um, develops the so-called Mindfulness Finding Peace in a Frantic World curriculum. Mm -hmm. This program <coughs> was written up as a book, but it's also been developed as an eight-week program. And there are now at least four randomized controlled trials suggesting it does precisely what I just said, improve mental health and well-being. This is one is with university students at Cambridge University. Very cleverly controlled um, design trial because it used the university terms, it used a weightless control, and it used the exam period as a period, which at Cambridge University is pretty intense, as a period of high stress. And again, I'm going to go over this quite quickly, but it very clearly demonstrated that um, 
This curriculum taught face-to-face -to, -face to Cambridge University students, improves well-being, those well-being changes sustained, and in fact, become slightly more pronounced during the stress of the exam period. So it's giving people ways of improving their well-being, but also managing the stress of exams at university. So these are young adults at university not presenting with mental health problems. And in a recent study, we have also extended that to show it actually also helps with academic um, with some academic outcomes as well, not exam grades as such, but academic and um, learning um, approaches to learning. Um, I want to just finish with um, this, which is, if you remember my point about the, um, the iceberg and the tip of the iceberg, there's probably no way that we can reach the whole population. Not probably. There is no way we can reach the whole population with individual psychotherapy. Even group-based approaches like MBSR and MBCT can't reach a whole population. They're just not designed to do that. So we need to design systems and processes to reach large numbers of people and to support those people on the journey with mindfulness. This is my argument. So this is the journey, if you like. This is the large group of people and this is their journey with mindfulness. And I think the reality is in the world today, the vast majority of people are being introduced to mindfulness through digital online apps. If you take three, Calm, Headspace, and the Insight Timer, I've looked at their stats, and I think at least 400 million people have been introduced to mindfulness through those three apps. But of course, they're introductory. Many people try it. Many of them like it, but most will go, okay, that was, that was interesting. But within a few months, their interest will drop off. And that might be much fine for some people. They'll learn something of value that maybe they can use in a low key way. Um, but what about people who want to go further? Well, Mark and Danny's book, Mindfulness Based, uh, Mindfulness Finding Peace in a Friendic World, um, seeing that my hour is nearly up, so I'll just, um, I am coming close to the end. Um, we asked, um, how does the book compare to the face-to-face -face program? And it's exactly what one would expect, that the book um, is much more accessible, but has a smaller effect. If you offer it to people in a face-to-face -face program, it's less accessible, but the effect is larger. I'm going to just skip <coughs> to the end here, and I'll make the slides available. What we're arguing with this funnel is that people will come in and things like apps are really helpful for them. Maybe books are helpful for them to go a bit further beyond that and online resources like um, uh, freely available practices, um, online um, courses where people can go deeper. But then I think if people want to go deeper yet, we need face-to-face -face programs. This one, we've developed a new program, program which um, is called MBCT for Life. So it takes the essential structure and the essential DNA, if you like, of MBCT for depression, but it actually makes it appropriate to the whole population. So there's more on the positive valence system, for example. There's more about how people can really integrate this into their life. And at the end of these courses, one of the biggest questions we get, the funnel's getting smaller now, is how can I take this further? So we've developed a further curriculum. We have two randomized controlled trials now on MBCD for Life, suggesting it does do what we hope, and we're conducting one at the moment on this curriculum. So to conclude, mental health and well-being are fundamental human rights. And I want to leave you, and I really feel very, very, I don't know what the word is, very, very hopeful seeing so many people from all over the world here today who can help to potentially realize this vision. Can we visit, envisage a world without the devastating effects of depression, where people enjoy mental health and well-being? and a resource to meet the challenges of the next 50 years. And I think the people here on the call today are the very people who are potentially going to be able to do that. All of the work I've described has been the work of colleagues and collaborators. This is some of them. Um, this is some images of some of them. I feel so incredibly 
privileged to work with some amazing people. I think the problems of the world, um, like depression and uh, the prevention of depression, are going to take teamwork. They're never going to be done by individuals. Um, people want to go deeper with some of the things I've said. I've created a resource pack. Again, I'll make that available after my talk. And I want to just finish by thanking you all very sincerely for your attention.